if you're a male and you go into the psychology, one of two things happens. They, you either already only have one testicle or they cut one off. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Beat Your Genes podcast. This is episode number 330. And in today's episode, Dr. Lyle discusses how do we navigate the instincts to make money and climb up the status ladder versus when we might need to beat our genes in order to be happier. I think it's an important discussion, especially given our modern environment and the ever, ever changing political landscape. And so there's a number of Dr. Lyle gems to take away. I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you in the video. All right. Well, Dr. Lyle, what's going on with you? Not too much. We're solo again, just you and me. Uh, Jen Hawk has to be, I had to go to Dallas to look at the eclipse. Oh, it was in Dallas. I thought, okay, okay. It's a lot of places, but it turned out yeah. that was a good spot. So uh, apparently she watched it from the, uh, the, the, the uh, grassy knoll. Do you know what that is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that where the second gunman was? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't know exactly where the second or third shooter was, but uh yeah, so she was I don't think she'd ever seen that before. Mm -hmm. So uh th th that's kind of an interesting thing to see. I I did. I went into the the room where Oswald was. They've got a little museum wow. there. So wow. uh yeah, it's not very it's not very far from where that car was. So mm -hmm. at any rate, that's what Jen Jen was doing, so that's why we're missing her this week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. well, we'll miss her. And, and we had some, uh, you know, uh, we have some questions today that, that are, uh, of course, beat your genes related, but our first yeah. question, Dr. Lyle is related to a previous episode. I think it was one or two episodes back. And it was about the, the listener who was frustrated with the lower income, uh, with their lower income relative to their friends. Yeah. So the question is, um, Dr. Lyle, you answered this question, uh, who was about a person who was frustrated about their lower income relative to their friends. But mm -hmm. one aspect of that question was that life isn't always about making money or climbing dominance hierarchies. Mm -hmm. In fact, the very same instincts to keep pursuing more can lead you to being unhappy. Mm -hmm. So then how then does one navigate when to pursue more and when to beat the genes? Are there any mm -hmm. rough approximations for gauging this? That's a really good question. And, um, uh... There, there would be a variety of perspectives. That, uh, that, that's a, that's a really good, complicated question to be asking about career, uh, income. How important is is uh, money for happiness, et cetera, et cetera. These are big questions. And the, um, I have a, I, I don't have a uh, in principle solution because the in principle solution would inherently only be possible through individual experimentation uh that that is that is not possible so you'd have to go live your life uh become a surgeon make eight hundred thousand dollars a year do that for five years see how you feel about it and then quit you know what i mean and become a vintner you know and and sell wine like you know and, and then become a custodian and just you know uh, uh join some fancy temple and just you know spend half of your life on your knees it's like who, who's to know what is the best thing to do? And the answer is all you can do is follow your intuition. So I can give you myself in this example. And that is that um, I, I could I could tell from the smell of hospitals and the amount of work that it was going to take to compete with other bright people to be able to get through med medical school that I wasn't interested in doing it. It wasn't worth it. And uh, I was willing to sacrifice uh basically take the number one most high status thing in the united states and take it off the table for myself just like no i'm out i'm i'm opting out of that the um certainly i think a lot of reasonably bright young people consider medicine um not because they have any inherent interest in medicine but they're inherently interested in status and so status and money so I actually read uh, books when I was a young man, when I was a teenager about medicine, and I was kind of sort of thinking that I was going to go that direction. I remember a book that I read was called The Making of a Surgeon uh, by William Nolan, and it was a very interesting tale of his of his odyssey through his career um, uh, as he learned to become a surgeon. 
and I, and it was exciting, you know, and you you hear the story of this person's uh, of his achievements and and how he learned to do things and how much he learned from other people and et cetera, et cetera. So, but it didn't matter. Like it, it was a great great idea to think about for a while being a fancy surgeon, and and then you know the realities come when you take your first chemistry class and it's like, oh really. <laughs> <laughs> this this kind of isn't what I cared about and uh and it's et cetera. So that was out. And um and then like any other bright young person, I considered the law. And uh my sister was an attorney, and my sister was instantaneously as a young person making like more money than my dad. And it's like, wow, that's that's pretty exciting and interesting. And it's just three years of law school. And then pretty soon you can do that. And I thought, you know, I have no interest in this at all. None. And arguing so um, what's that? Arguing, arguing the law and arguing with people just you know, didn't, about um, nuances. I, I, can, I can actually tell you, uh, this is a long soliloquy of my own odyssey, but it's one way to tell the story. And that is that um, I think that inherently i was um i was impressed by libertarian philosophy and i was therefore wanting to be skilled at something that had real world value as opposed to something that would be utterly and totally worthless if the political situation changed so a lawyer has no skill they have a, they have rights. They are a guild. Okay, they are a a, mm. a method for having an you know basically a, a method of restricting the supply of a particular procedure. It's like a plumber's guild. Like oh yeah, you can do plumbing without a plumbing license, but you could never put a lien on somebody's house if they didn't pay you, and you can't have the work contracted so that it will never be legal. So yes, you could theoretically hire somebody without a plumbing license to do your plumbing, but they would be behaving illegally uh, and et cetera. And you now have an illegal plumbing in your house. So the plumber is a member of a guild who they have a legitimate skill that actually helps something. But the whole point of having licensure is not to protect the public, of course, this is about to protect the plumbers so that the plumbers can earn more dollars per hour uh, by restricting the supply and basically putting up barriers to entry for the profession. Very simple. Okay. So, um, but notice that it's different than the law. The law, if, if there's a regime change or you wanted to leave the United States and go work in, in Ecuador, your skills are useless. There, there's there's nothing that you do that you have no useful skill. So you might have brains, but you don't have any useful skill and you don't have any rights that make you different than some guy on the street that walks in, you know, uh, uh, wearing moccasins and a T-shirt. So. So therefore, I was wanting to make sure that I could answer to the free market. In other words, I, I want to be able to actually accomplish something that people will pay for whether or not there's a government that exists. And so um, and so I wasn't sure what that was going to be. But when, when I, uh, I was certainly drawn to counseling, psychology, solving people's problems that they're struggling with, et cetera, et cetera. That was inherent in me to do that. And um, uh, it's not a particularly rare characteristic. In other words, a lot of people like that Probably more women have that than men, uh, naturally. But I, I, you know, as I told one client famously, uh, that was, I don't know, I, I think I've told this story on here at some point. I had a client that was so testosteroneized that as I was tr trying to, in a couple session, effectively give them, a, give him a little bit of guidance as smooth as possible to, to essentially give him even the slightest bit of of suave i basically said listen you don't have it in you you don't have any chick in you at all and but you know as a psychotherapist 
you know, if you're a male psychotherapist, the truth of the matter is you got to be half chick or you can't do this job. So I can actually help you with this because I'm uniquely qualified. If you're a male and you go into the psychology, one of two things happens. They, you either already only have one testicle or they cut one off. <laughs> 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 and I said, in my case, they didn't have to cut one off. I only had one. He goes, I got yours. I, I, I got the spare one. <laughs> so, but anyway, I forget where this came from. The point is, is that I, I had just enough of this chick counseling mentality that, that psychology drew me towards this. And, um, and so anyway, so what I did then was I tried to figure out, it seemed like it was an adequate socioeconomic status, but I wasn't sure. And so it was a little sketchy. This is the early 1980s. Psychology isn't quite as well defined. It was just barely getting its way into the insurance uh, racket. In other words, it just started to get coverage as a benefit in health insurance. And so that was actually probably a non-trivial, um, of non-trivial importance to me at that time. I thought, okay, this is going to be, and I actually remember reading Allied Health Professional. And I'm like, oh, that's what I want to be. I want to make sure I'm an allied health professional. In other words, I want to be in this game where there's, where the, where the negotiations and guilds have been involved. So I'm like a plumber. OK, uh, I'm like a plumber that has a license that other people can't do what I do. I'm doing something that people find uh, inherently useful and they would find inherently useful in principle in a Stone Age environment. The um, uh, so it is a it's a there's a skill here that is potentially useful to trade for coconuts if that's all there was, knowing full well that it was a little bit of a lot. It was certainly a luxury. In other words, it, it was something that in, in the world of the United States of the 20th century, going to a psychologist was a real sign of weirdness and bizarreness until 1970. Okay, so, you know, if you went to a psychologist in 1955, that was weird. Okay, and you, you were, there's something strange about you that you would do such a thing. Uh, by 1985, that was much less true. So by the time I'm going in, in grad school, it's more, it's almost like, well, you should do therapy, almost like you should go to the gym. You know what I mean? So it, 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 the culture had shifted significantly and psychologists were clearly somewhere in, somewhere in the below an MD, but not too far below was kind of the socioeconomic status. And um, and so as a result of that, my attitude is, oh, I'm fine with that. Like I, I'm fine, you know, having this sort of income level and the prestige level in the society that it isn't as fancy as a surgeon or an MD or a psychiatrist, but I'm actually doing what it is that I want to do and that I think it's valuable and I'm being reasonably well paid for it. So <clears throat> I'm thinking... Without a doubt, I'm thinking uh, wife working half time at semi skilled labor, hopefully, you know, good looking wife, pleasant, good mother, can handle two kids that are going to be, of course, perfect. And then I can work full time and I'm making a good, i.e., the, the equivalent today, you know, back in the day, it was 50,000 was a big number back then. Today, that number would be 100 ish. OK, some 100 to 150 today or something like that. So and that is exactly what typical psychologist positions pay these days. If you were to work as a psychologist in some system, you'd make one hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars or something. OK, well, if we, when we look nationwide, what that means, that means an, a house in a nice suburb. You know what I mean? Uh, not fancy, but perfectly acceptable for uh the standard of living for most women looking for mates. Not a star, but no embarrassment and everything's fine. Okay. In other words, marry for love rather than the guy's wallet. That is exactly the position that I needed to make sure that I was in. 
Okay. I was not at 21 years old saying, oh no, you know, you make sure you're in a position to buy your way into the very possible highest echelon that you can get. No. Okay. So in other words, the, but I'm looking at this whole thing and essentially I, I'm aiming my behavior, interestingly enough, at the right female. Let's, as, as Onassis said, if it wasn't for women, money would have no meaning. Okay. So the, uh, Agreed. <laughs> okay. So clearly, I mean, if, if if everybody was paid the same, I'm not sure exactly what it is that I would do. You know, I'm saying that that gets to be a little bit curious. I don't I'm not even sure what it would be, but I'd be coaching basketball part time, probably. Uh, uh, I, I might teach stats. So I might teach stats for six or eight hours a week to bright young people. And I might teach basketball six or eight hours a week to bright young people. And then, I don't know, might counsel a few people. I do that some. And then, then I don't know, do some gardening. I don't know. But the point is, is that... I noticed you conveniently left out art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, that's out. So, uh, but actually something that, that I really like to do is, for example, land, landscape architecture. So landscaping things you'd never know it by looking at my house because i never have time and i'm never bothered with it but the point is i would you know what i mean if 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 money were no object what would i do you know, i'd plant trees and flowers and you know i'd jump in a pool and then i'd go shoot some baskets and teach some kids some stuff and then i'd do a little teaching of statistics which i consider to be really inherently valuable and super interesting and then i would also um counsel people about this and that I think that's what I would do. I'm not sure. Also, yeah, the the landscaping would fulfill my desire for some hard labor. You know what I mean? Get the shovel in your hand and dig some things and maybe do a little masonry out there. And you know, that that's what I would do. Okay, now, so the it turns out that coaching little kids in basketball isn't going to pay what they pay a psychologist. And it turns out there isn't really part-time convenient work for teaching bright young people statistics that are interested. So it's like, no, I'm not going to do those things. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do the, the one thing in the group that, I, you know, that is actually potentially highly diverse. So within psychology, it's like the law. You could do all kinds of things, okay? Or medicine. You could do all kinds of different things in medicine. So the, um, but in psychology, it's it's very broad. So it's basically try and do things that I find valuable, be reasonably well paid for it. And the um, those things feel to me to be honorable and good. Um, and so therefore I feel perfectly, I feel like it's a very reasonable um, feedback to the world about who it is that I am, as would the montage that I just put together. If I taught young people basketball and taught some other bright young people statistics and w went went and dug things and planted plum trees and then did some counseling, that too would actually be, if that was financially no different than being a surgeon, then it'd be like, oh, well, I'm definitely going to do that. I'll take that plan over there, that plan, plan G. That plan G is do 25% time of, of those four things are their equivalent. And that makes you the same hundred thousand dollar income is anything else you would do well in that case that's the one that i would have picked okay now so but that's not the world we live in the truth is is that if you're a, pe a person of any reasonable intelligence you can actually uh when i say reasonable intelligence mm, 75th percentile iq or above in other words uh uh if you have that level of chops i.e not too swift, but four-year college graduate capable. Okay, so you're that's what you could basically pull off legitimately without cheating on your, without having your big sister write your term paper. Okay, so you could actually do it. If you've got a 75th percentile brain, you have the ability to learn things that would be very valuable financially. If you're a 75th percentile IQ, you could probably be a paralegal. And you might be able to be an RN. So probably, maybe not, 
uh, it may have gotten sufficiently competitive at this point that you may need to be an 85th percentile person to be an RN, but maybe not. Probably if you worked hard enough and took it slow enough. Uh, and an RN is very good, respectable money. Do you want to do it? The answer, some people actually like it. Other people, there's no way in hell. No more likely than, than I would become an MD. And so the, uh, and if you're a paralegal, it's like you, you might not be quite smart enough to be a lawyer, uh, but you're smart enough to help one and take direction. And it's like, if you do that, no, you're, you're worth more money there than you are in, in most other places. The question is, is it worth it? Is it worth working at something that you don't like to make 80,000 a year when you could do something else that would make you 60? So when we get down to this, we, we work our way through the equations that are actually set, sitting at the root of the entire human motivation and feeling system. It's all about parameters and gene survival units. Uh, this is all basically the math of feeling. And so it's like, well, I really wouldn't want to be a paralegal, but my next alternative is that it would, it would make, I'd make 40000 as a librarian. So do I want to make $80,000 a year as a paralegal or $40,000 a year as a, it depends on where you live. What does that translate to? What does it mean for your mating situation? You can see that if you're a woman and you're like, oh, I'd much rather be a librarian and it's $40,000. What do you need the other $40,000 for? You don't necessarily have cause to, to if $40,000, you're in the middle of Iowa and $40,000 is a decent living. You don't need that other $40,000 unless you want to have a cuter and fancier little house and go on some trips to Europe and blah, blah, right? But the truth of the matter is, it's the male that needs to be looking at that problem. That's important. He better look at that problem. If he's not, he better be handsome as hell and be willing to trade down 10% or whatever. In other words, a standard male is attempting to go make, quote, a killing and then lay it at the feet of females as be better because other males are willing to do that. Uh, males are willing, by the way, in a very non-PC comment, do things that women aren't willing to do because they're a hell of a lot less pleasant. So you're not going to find a lot of women at the bottom of a coal mine. And women somehow often mysteriously think the guys just like to strap on tool belts, you know what I mean, and put out warning cones. But the truth of the matter is they do those things because they pay better. They are un, in less pleasant employment situations. So if you're working out in a garage as a diesel mechanic, you know, that's hot and it's not air conditioned and it's noisy and you have earplugs and you got grease on your hands and you have little cuts, you are, you're making $38 an hour, but you can't make that indoors behind some desk doing something pleasant answering phones. In there, it, it's $22. And there's a hell of a difference between $22 and $38. And you know it as, as a male who has to compete with other males who are willing to be out there in right next to you in that, in that diesel bed. So this isn't to say that women don't work hard and do unpleasant things to make money. They do. But, or, but the question now becomes how to optimize your life experience. And it's like, well, we can't really talk about the value of money unless you talk about the value of money as it translates to gene survival units in the organism. And it's going to turn out it has a very significant difference between males and females as to how that's going to translate into gene survival units. And so I believe that you, were, you could de determine that males probably feel worse, more embarrassed, and more insecure and more inherently at a competitive disadvantage with respect to your, their financial issues than females, okay? Females are not feeling the reverberating wider context of their financial issues as they relate to what that means for their mating prospects. They do, do not have that calculus in their heads, okay? If they do have that calculus in their heads, they are overly conscientious and deluded into thinking that that's important, okay? Uh, they have taken on some bizarre biases from somebody, but they are they are mistaken about that. The um, but if you're a male and you don't know that, you are naive as hell. So, what to do? 
this this person felt badly about their situation, quote, relative to their friends, relative to the differences in in uh, in income situation. Well, let's look at that. So the um, so what answer do I have for you? And the answer is, who are the friends and mates that you are attempting to qualify for? Okay, who are those people? And the um, and so that that needs to be the socioeconomic status. You don't need to equal their status, but you need to to be respected by them. In other words, you would need to have the feedback from them that you may not make as much money as they make, but you your work and who you are and what you do is is respected as a peer. Okay. So that otherwise, you know, if for some strange reason they would literally look down on you for this, then either you're hanging with the wrong people or aiming at the wrong specific individuals, or there's something inherently haywire about the socioeconomic status of what it is that you're doing. Now, so the feelings that you may have about a socio, uh, Feelings of, of depression, jealousy, anger, upset, it's pleasantness, euphoria, ecstasy, romantic excitement, all feelings are nothing other than translations of gene survival unit probabilities. That's all they are. Okay. You feel hot, you feel cold, you feel tired, you feel sleepy, you feel energetic, you feel excited, you feel jealous. All you're talking about is gene survival unit probability. Uh, derivatives. Feelings are nothing other than the analog translation of that mathematics. So if you are feeling um, unhappy with that discrepancy, then there would be a variety of uh, perspectives that we would need to analyze that. Um, who are the individuals that you are feeling like you are somehow short of their situation. Do they look down on you? Do you feel like they're gloating over you? Do you feel um, do you feel also that you have somehow sold yourself short, et cetera? Do you really enjoy what you do, but you're frustrated because you aren't earning enough money? Um, and enough money for what? What was it that you were thinking when you decide to pursue this line of work as opposed to alternative lines of work that might have been less interesting to do, but paid more money more reliably. Okay. There is no absolute solution. All there is is nothing other than um, bell curves and parameter estimates, i.e., what if you really loved to do art, but they only were going to pay you $20,000 a year to do it, but you had the brains. To, to be a crackerjack lawyer that could be making 250. Okay, are you really gonna do, are, is that what you're gonna do? The answer is if you're a beautiful woman that is likely to be able to marry some shit kicking dude that's gonna make that quarter million dollars, then you just go right ahead and paint, honey. There's no reason why you shouldn't, okay? Uh, there may be no, absolutely no reason. Also it depends upon how valuable is that money for what resources? I mean, we're, so do you have family money behind you? Do you have any kind of illness that would cause you to be, uh, are you not so beautiful and therefore you, you're you not gonna have it that easy in the mating market? Is it likely that any mate that you would ever get, do you wanna have children? And if that's gonna be the case, are you gonna need to be pulling your weight and basically be equally yoked to somebody at which point, you know, it's gonna make a difference. You know, if he can only make $52,000 a year and you could, could make 52, but you're choosing to make 22, what does that mean? It's like oh, a lot of calculus in this equation. So anybody that's trying to come up with um, a, a definitive perspective about the right solution already has made a mistake. It is inherently individualized. That is why I said that the only in principle solution would be an endless series of experiments that you don't have time in this life to do. So... What instead you have to do is, I did not articulate at 22 years old when I was making this decision that I was 
I never articulated to anybody and didn't transform it into the language that I have now that I'm aiming at a middle to upper middle class, bright, pretty female who would consider that level of achievement to be sufficient. That is exactly what I was doing. There's absolutely no question. And I can now I can articulate that. Now I can remember, um, I can remember Alan questioning me about whether that was true. He actually felt like psychologists were lower brow than that. Um, we actually had this conversation. This is 42 years ago. So 42 years ago, this conversation was taking place in, in, a, in a ratty little house in Portland, Oregon. Were there sprouts <laughs> growing in the background? Sprouts growing, and we yeah. never mowed the front lawn. Alan just said, "No, we're not mowing." It. Lawn and it just the weeds <laughs> just got higher and higher. And uh, and uh, when when Alan met his wife Jennifer, she goes, "Gosh, don't you even cut the lawn?" He goes, "No, isn't it beautiful? All the flowers, dandelions." <laughs> <laughs> that was the uh, Jennifer. I had also heard from him about the beautiful garden in the backyard. She went and looked at that thing. It was just, you know, I mean, there's nothing beautiful about it. It was utilitarian and just completely low rent. That hey, uh, salesman, the um, but at any rate, I remember him thinking, no, nah, psychologist is kind of lowbrow, and I'm thinking, I don't think that it is. And it was actually, I remember being a little irritated, i.e., because you're feeling like, hey, you're discounting. You can actually feel the threat to the status of what it is that you're going to do. Now, fortunately, I had an uncle who was a psychologist and it was Dr. Fairchild. And so, you know, I talked to him about this and we talked about his, about what he did practice wise. And the, um, he was a very nice man, obviously didn't know anything about anything, but he was, was a nice man. And he was also a Dean at a local college. And so it was high status. You know what I mean? He was perfectly, he was exactly the socioeconomic status that I was aiming at. And so it turned out, no, I was right, but I had checked into it and I really thought about it. So if you're a person that um, there would be multiple perspectives to be taking on a question of this, of, like this, you can see how complicated and nuanced it is to the individuals. Are you a male or a female? Okay. You know, if you're a female, are you heterosexual? If you are not heterosexual female and you intend to be the, the breadwinner of a pair that then you know, raises children, what does that mean? In other words, everybody's situation is different. Are you a trust fund child or has an awful lot of money behind you, therefore you're not gonna have to achieve that much and still be protected and safe financially? All of these things make a difference. They're all in the game, okay? Remember, if, the, if it didn't look like this, what would I do? If it, if making a good living wasn't a fitness indicator, it was just what you did and what people thought of you and what, what, what would I do? Teach some basketball, do a little counseling, gr grow some trees. And what was the fourth thing that I, oh, oh teach stats. Teach stats, yeah. I would. Okay, I some actually, young people. Yeah. I actually really, really enjoyed teaching stats. Um, the um, it, statistics, from for me just to brag but but by 1985 my attitude was how can you even function in this world without a knowledge of statistics good foundation just so that people know 40 years later that's running your world 40 years later data analytics solving exactly the kinds of problems that statistical methods solve is literally shaping the entire political, economic, sports, you know, geopolitical, uh, de defense, medical, everything. Okay, so we, we are now understanding that, uh, un you know, that logic that sits underneath statistics is immense of immense value in human decision making, dangerously so, obviously. But the point is, is that. I smelled early, whoa, this is how to determine the nature of reality. And to this day, it feels inherently valuable for me to explain this to somebody, okay? So uh, I am aware that the world, there's only one in 300 of us out here that understand enough about stats to actually be in a position to make uh, good decisions on a, on a complex uh, matter. The, um, 
Now, so um, where are we with all this? The the secret of life is to enjoy the passing of time. Your passing of time is is something that is going to happen to you whether you like it or not. It is absolutely inevitable. The avalanche has started to come down the mountain and there is absolutely no stopping it. It cannot be reversed. So your life is going to pass and then you're going to be done. So the only real question is, how much do you enjoy the process? That's it. So now it's like, okay, what will what will that involve? And it will involve several factors. Um, but a chief factor among them will be the decisions that you will make along the way. So things will happen accidentally. You won't be making a decision that has any variance of the output if it turns out that you're going across an intersection and a drunk is flying through there and now you're maimed or dead, okay? That there wasn't a damn thing you could do about that. All we can do is we can make better decisions about things that have um, alternative outcomes of which we are attempting to estimate what, which we will get the most enjoyment out of. It's literally, life's like a massively complicated three-dimensional menu. You're in the restaurant and you're trying to choose what it is that you would like to eat, okay? And every day you've got 16 hours to eat. And the question is, what are you gonna eat today? And hopefully you find some things that when you eat them consistently, you really like them, okay? So you don't have to come up with new things every day because you know there's only 15 foods that I eat in my whole life and I've eaten those same 15 foods for the last 15 years. So you don't have to keep coming up with new people. Um, you don't have to keep coming up with uh, new interesting things to do. You don't have to come up with any new sports teams. In other words, you can you get to repeat things that you enjoy doing over and over again. If you have something in your life that is that is repetitively irritating, that's where we need to raise our eyebrow. Okay. Is it a mate that we fight with or that we have conflicts with or a friend that we have conflicts with or a job situation that we have conflicts with or we have internal cognitive dissonance over choices that we've made, for example, about our career or where we live, okay? So I can't imagine, I don't know, living in Northern Minnesota and bitching about the weather. I just can't imagine it. It's like, did you ever hear of Florida? Okay, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have one of my one of my favorite people is a a physician that lives in Sweden, and she'll send me pictures of how freezing cold it is, and then the sun will finally peek out a little bit, and she'll be like, "Oh, thank God! You know, we could see the sun. We haven't seen it in two months." And if she had the choice, you know, she'd be in the south of France in about five minutes. In other words, if she could move there and live there, she would be there. She would not be up there freezing in, in the dark in Sweden. So no offense to Swedes. If you like freezing in the dark, you probably do. That's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, my, my, my wonderful friend is not one of those people. She wants to move south where it's warm. And every chance she gets, she gets on a plane and goes to Spain. And so... Uh, but the point is, is that if you're in Minnesota right now and you don't like it, I would hope that you would take a look down at the South and move, for God's sakes. Find a way to do it and find out. Or, uh, in other words, run experiments and, and see what you think. And the same thing is true with any parameter in your life. If um, uh, So this individual who, I can't remember the whole story, but the features of the cognitive dissonance what the person is, what the nuances are going on inside their mind in terms of what they are thinking about, what they are feeling about it, who are the individuals and the feedback that are involved here. These are all important components of, you know, is this cognitive dissonance going away and what is the price that you're paying for having made the, the career decisions that you have made, okay? So sometimes that can mean just, you know, I don't know, moving a hundred miles away from your mother-in-law that you have to put up with this shit as you have to hear about how the other son-in-law is doing so well at the firm. You know what I mean? Like 
we don't, if it's that specifically what it is, and we can do a specific thing to get away from it. But if it's a more global, more uh, diffuse issue, and the person's having a hard time facing the a feeling of financial deprivation relative to what it is that would seem reasonable for them to achieve, um, and they're seeing other people not put up with with the, those uh, the, those deprivations, then mm, interesting. Then is there some education or remedial action that might be worth doing? Hard to know. You know what I'm saying, but the, it, it's it's worth looking at. There is a. It's not unreasonable to, if you get hit over the head with enough evidence that says, maybe I should be doing something that's more lucrative and make more money. I could do it. I, uh, there's people around me that are doing it, have done it. And I'm. it's not like I'm so in love working for, I don't know, Greenpeace as I thought I was going to be. Okay. So the um, it's on the table. And the reason why it's on the table is because your job is to enjoy the passing of time. And if there's something that you are doing in that process that's actually causing you some, some low-grade chronic discomfort, it's worth looking at it hard and, and considering a way to experiment to see what it'd be worth to change it. Okay, That's amazing. Right. Dr. Lyle, it's really, it kind of shows, it, it helps me kind of connect that, that with consilience, if the main goal is to be happy, you have to understand the psychology of the individual so that when you set up political systems, if you've got so many barriers to entry for all these different professions out there, it limits the amount of experiments people can do to figure out what makes them happy. Because, you know, I, I've, I've talked to friends before they are saying, you know, I wonder, I wonder if I would like being a, a physician's assistant or a medical doctor or this. And it's like, Mm, but it's going to take me 11 or 12 years to actually figure it out, you know, not yeah. to say that medicine can be done in, you know, sure. a year or a weekend course, but I'm just saying is that if someone just wants to, he, you know, to learn how to say, uh, cast a broken arm, they can learn specifically that rather than, you know, everything that's required to become a medical doctor or some other things. And this political system makes it much more difficult to do that and then try to figure out what makes people happy. The, uh, to, to take a deep global view, and of course, it's it's kind of nice the fact that Dr. Hawk isn't here, so I don't have to be thinking through what she's thinking when I say something, and then knowing that she'd say something more elaborately and, and more sophisticated and then criticize something. I, I just get to just say it. The truth is, is that governments are inherently problematic. They, they I'm sure, arrived inherently spontaneously uh, out of a warrior class that evolved naturally out of a natural social psychological process uh, in order to defend capital. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you have that, as soon as you have a warrior class that are, are capable of killing everybody in the society and taking whatever it is it that they want, then you can understand that they are going to be highly exploitative of the farmers that they are, quote, serving. In fact, they are not serving the farmers. The farmers are serving them on their knees as the king or the holy Roman emperor or whoever the who it is. They, I mean, you go look at the Vatican and you see how much gold and incredibly expensive art and what that took to do. And you realize, oh, no, that, that isn't this great thing. You know, Pope Pius such and such didn't do any of those paintings. That, that was... Farmers made the money to pay Michelangelo's, you know, lifetime so that he could do it. That's exactly what happened. So the bottom line is, is governments, it's almost impossible for them not to become exploitative. Now, in in recent times and in most times, all it is is that the warrior class simply lives like unbelievably, unbelievably uh, self-indulgent douchebags and and murder people randomly that they don't like or that they got problems with and terrorize populations i.e louis the 14th e eating off gold plates that's that's what it's been and that remains to be true if you're quote a democratically elected person somewhere in south america most of the time you know banana republics in other words that's what they do they pilfer societies they live like kings and then if they get you know they get shot at, they pack up and leave and try to survive somewhere. 
It's really well documented in a book called uh, King of the Mountain uh, by Arthur Ludwig, who's a psychiatry professor at the University of Kentucky, he basically shows that's what politics is. Now, in Western democracies, the whole point of Western democracies was to stop that. The entire point of Western democracies was governments by the people, for the people, of the people, and that so we're not going to have that kind of thing. Well, we do. So as, remember, fundamentally, it's a warrior class. Somebody is in charge. The president of the United States is the commander in chief. That means if he wants to march a bunch of armies, well, he couldn't without congressional approval until 1960s when they just did it anyway without a declared war. Okay, so pretty soon they they got rid of all of the safeguards that were supposed to be put in there and are gone. And now you have a essentially a, a, a classic banana republic emperor device of huge proportions. And it has infiltrated every possible area of the economy down to the fact that you can't be talking to somebody about their psychological problems you know, without a license. Now, that's ludicrous, of course. And it's ludicrous that you can't have somebody study in, you know, ma make sure that when you go into court that you've actually, you know, that you're taking on little, there, there's no reason in the world that I couldn't uh, do an, be an understudy to an attorney right now. No, none at all. There's no, there's no reason that at 16, I couldn't have been an understudy to an attorney. And by 17, I've been arguing cases perfectly within civil procedure or criminal procedure for that matter. In other words, uh, before the court, none. There's no reason at all. And, and by 18, I would have mopped the floor with 90% of the attorneys that were working in Los Angeles. There's no question that would have been true. The, uh, but what do we have instead? Oh, no, you can't go to law school until you got a four-year undergrad degree. Oh, and then after you go to four-year degree, then you go three years to law school. So don't even think about it, hotshot 18-year-old. So as a result, what does this do? It's a barrier to entry and a restriction of supply of those individuals so that they can get un un unnaturally high market fees for what their IQ and capabilities really are, okay? So instead of being able to hire an extremely competent 19-year-old hotshot lawyer that never went to law school and be able to have them take your case as a landlord-tenant dispute, and pay them $45 an hour to do it and have them do a hell of a job and completely because you were in the right, okay, to actually have your case extremely well served for $2,500. Oh, no, no, not a chance. No chance that that's going to be where this is going to go. This isn't going to be $2,500 for a major case. This isn't going to be, no, 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 no. This is going to be $15,000. You're going to give it to me up front on a retainer, okay? Of course. Medicine, classic for this. So uh, me medicine was not accomplished until the 20th century. And it was at the brainchild of John D. Rockefeller. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he created the modern, uh, uh, basically, biomed, biotech state that you now see. Okay? Yeah, like the and so report, doctors, yeah. doctors around the world don't make anything like the wages that people make in the United States. So uh, that's because they don't have such a, they're not so embedded into the government system. So you think, oh, a doctor, United States doctor, oh my God, that's a $400,000 a year human. Really? Okay. That, that human being in Mexico makes three times what, what an average wage earner makes, something like that. Okay. So we'd have to look it up, but it's, it's on that range. In the United States, it's nowhere close. If your average rate wage earner makes $40,000, doctors aren't making 120. They're making a hell of a lot more than that. Okay, so why is that? Not because of their great skill and great intelligence. All, all what you should see is you should see them commensurate with what? The level of skill, the level of mental ability that it took to require that skill, the time and energy and the investment of the capital that it required to do it. Well, what does it require to do it? Answer, not that much. Almost anything you see done in medicine doesn't take very much training to do it. Okay, so that they'll say, oh yes, years of med school, really? You show me a single guy right now out there that's dispensing drugs that could possibly do a problem that they did 18 years ago in 
in chemistry. They couldn't possibly do that problem. Why the hell are they doing that problem? Oh, because we need that information. No, you don't. The army trains somebody to be an army medic in very short order. Okay, so this is not complicated at all. The vast majority of things that medical doctors do are extremely not complicated. And this would be the fact that one guy or girl might have to know quite a bit to pass an exam is irrelevant to the services that they actually provide to individuals. So as a result, it would not take long at all to train somebody to be an OBGYN. Not at all. Okay, so what would you have to do? You'd have to learn that way, the way you would learn anything. You would be an apprentice. Okay, so actually, apparently the case, uh, I, I don't know the particulars of this story, but apparently there was a an uneducated African-American man in the 1950s and 60s at Johns Hopkins was a guy that assisted on surgeries and developed a tremendous amount about surgical technique and even surgical tools. He was a little guy that was probably a really good fisherman. And he, he was good with his hands and he was good with these mechanical problems. He didn't need to know the Krebs cycle. This is, this is no more complicated really than an engine. And so uh, apparently that guy was responsible and was given a lot of credit later by, by surgeons that worked with him, they said, oh, my, I learned a tremendous amount from this guy. So uh, instrumental in our ability to advance surgical technique. Who was it? High school. Okay, so yes, you are right. The, 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 the government has segmented the economy into guilds. Uh, and there are people that are protected and be, making unnaturally high wages as a result of this. And this is now of course, infiltrated its way into what they call omnibus bills in Congress of you know hundreds of billions of dollars that see to it that all kinds of people are paid all kinds of wages that would never be supported in a free market situation as it's basically a, a feeding frenzy aimed at money that is paid for by hardworking people that pay their taxes. This is fact, okay? So... That is the truth. And some guy that is an eye surgeon that makes a really good living, he does not understand that that's why it is that he makes $500,000 a year. He does not have any clue. He is completely clueless about this. He worked really hard. He jumped through all these hoops. But the truth is what he did and how well he does it could, could have been done by a, a, a sure-handed, quite bright 20-year-old. You just had to start training them at 16. And then by, by the time they were 20, they would be fully competent to be a highly competent eye surgeon. And that eye surgeon and removing the cataracts and doing this or that could absolutely be done by that individual without a doubt, okay? That's how complicated that procedure is. Could, could that person pass all the classes and haven't got through med school and through residency? No. Do they need to? Of course not. Of course not. So the... Uh, so this is all, you know, structural equation modeling in psychology. So you better be able to take that test and know what it is in order to get your license. Really? To, to try to help somebody and counsel them and give them some, you know, increased self-confidence by some insight that Joe the bartender might be able to give them to. You're telling me that you need to know what a structural equation model is to do that? Of course not. Many bartenders are so, better therapists. You know, they're just course. naturally good with people. Yeah. No Listening question. So you are, this is a rant on a, on actually ex exactly, we, we will see over and over again that, that many of the problems that people face in life are unnatural. That's what makes them so frustrating. There are bizarre prices associated with things. So the entire pleasure trap is unnatural. Okay. The, the fact that people are now addicted to their cell phones is unnatural. The, the, the mating problems that you see in the feedback systems and calibration systems, you know, with respect to uh, dating apps is unnatural. And the fact that people cannot try out several different things in this life, you know, as apprentices and try to find their way to something that they would love to do is unnatural. And the disparity of incomes between individuals in the society relative to the value of their work is unnatural. There's no, it's not even close, okay? 
there, there, there is no way the civil engineer that's making $125,000 a year, highly competent at restoring some pretty sophisticated equipment up there in the oil fields of Alberta. That individual is absolutely as mentally competent as a surgeon. This, I, there, there's no question. They're every bit as intelligent as that surgeon. Okay, So the fact that they're making one fourth or one fifth of what the surgeon makes has absolutely nothing to do with anything other than the government. So the surgeon reasonably says, yeah, but I had to spend 13 freaking years. It's like, yeah, we know you did. You had to jump through a self-imposed guild that, you know, basically got congressional, uh, got congressional legal process in place to make this extremely difficult to protect the existing individuals from competitive pressure. Of course they did. Okay. And so that, you know, so we do have that problem, uh, in the society and that also there, there are, uh, the, the, the wonderful motivational speaker, uh, Jim Rohn, uh, tells the story and I won't tell it well about, you know, there's this big thing that goes up in the sky and then comes crashing down and shakes the earth from all around. And then after a little while, it goes back on the sky and comes crashing down and shakes the earth for miles around. And a guy comes along and says, that's really a stupid arrangement. Why the hell do they do that? And, and Rohn's answer is, uh, don't stand under it. Make sure you stand over there for God's sakes. And the truth of the matter is, is that uh, this person that might be frustrated with their financial situation, one of the reasons is you may not have been paying a close attention to protected classes. That you may be actually, you, you may be among the unprotected, that effectively you are in the free market without because you don't happen to belong to a group of people and a process that was able to be argued from for the public good to be you know to be protected by a governmental mandate in order to stop free enterprise processes from having com competition actually uh, uh, wind up having reasonable wages being paid. So that uh, so as a result, you know, you could see people that are in protected classes and looking at them and looking at yourself and you're like, what I'm doing is just as valuable inherently as what they're doing. Why are they making three times as much money? And now I feel that a competitive process deprived, et cetera. It's like, well, that's because you weren't paying attention to essentially the political landscape that you live in. So the long and short of it all uh, is that we have to pay attention to those things. We have to be reasonably savvy. And uh, when when my sister and I went to school, my dad said, I'm not sending you there unless you get a license to steal. He says, that's what you have to have. You've got to have something that gives you, i.e., a competitive advantage. Um, and I remember him saying that. And it's like, you know what? I wasn't going to get a competitive advantage, but I don't want to be at a competitive disadvantage either. And that's that rings through this question that the person asked. Are you actually operating your life at a competitive disadvantage in this sphere? And if that's true, you know, face that and realize that and let's hope that there's sufficient satisfaction and that you can aim enough at the esteem from people that would matter to you that it's not gonna matter. It's not about making the last nickel on the table that you can make. It's about making sure that, it, that it's good enough. And you're the one that has to be able to know what that is. Life will present us with some, you know, puzzling choices and try to peering through the mist to try to optimize your life experiences. You know, it's not easy to see clearly. And so it's also reasonable to sometimes look at this thing and realize, hey, I may have made a mistake. You know, I may have made a mistake. So I've had people that um, we were able to identify that they made a mistake. They made a career mistake. It was completely reasonable that they did, but they did make a mistake. And, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, unless you're 58, there's, there's time. It's time to make it right. Yeah. That's it for this episode. Really appreciate you watching, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Please make sure to click like, share, and subscribe as it helps out a lot for our channel. 
And if you have a question or a situation that you'd like asked and analyzed, you can send it in through the website www.beatyourgenes.org or you can email me directly at beatyourgenes at gmail.com and I'm happy to put your question into the queue. If you're a new subscriber to our YouTube channel and you're wondering where the rest of the episodes went, you can listen to older episodes uh, on any major podcasting platform like iTunes or Spotify or Libsyn. Um, I'm slowly uploading past episodes to the video format um, or you can just go to beatyourgenes.org uh, to look at past episodes as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.